Welcome to another episode of the Collective Evolution Podcast. Uh, today, we are going to be interviewing in studio here, uh, which the studio is not really set up for two people, but we're going to make it work. Um, Arjun Walia. So he's been with uh, Collective Evolution and the Pauls for almost 14 years now. You've probably been reading many of his articles over the course of the last two years. If you've been following us for a very long time, you would have read many of his articles over the course of time. Uh, he is the senior most journalist here, so it's more than likely you've you've heard from him. Um, in terms of what we're going to talk about here today, we're going to get into a lot of what's gone down over the last couple of years. We're going to talk about the media industry. We're going to talk about the new Elon Musk and Twitter drama and some of what's going on there. Uh, we're going to get into the Great Reset and a specific question about discerning some of the solutions that are being presented by people out there versus some of the solutions being presented by uh, the Great Reset and how similar they can be and how we're going to know or discern what is a proper way for us to move forward as a society if we value things like freedom and autonomy and these sorts of things. So we're going to be talking about all those as well as, of course, we'll get into COVID-related conversations, including some stuff about the vaccine and this sort of thing. Uh, so if you're curious about any of these topics, by all means, let's dive in. Coming in, tail into 2022, uh, probably <clears throat> next year we, we celebrate 15 years doing this work. So we're like less than six months away. Wow. Uh, is this the crazy it's ever, it's, it's craziest it's ever been? Yeah, I mean been quite the journey i mean right now it's like a business wise it's tough to be in but i mean with everything that's going on with covid and people quote unquote waking up to certain things um it's it's definitely crazy whereas before like we were writing about stuff even stuff that we still write about today <laughs> <laughs> uh, the people had no idea about and we we're completely unaware of and now all of a sudden everyone's aware of certain things which has also created problems because you know there's still a lack of critical thinking and mm -hmm. um proper examination and stuff like that but yeah it's it's crazy right now um and we kind of saw it coming like a long time ago that it would be like this and now it's here so it's, it's pretty yeah. crazy yeah to think back it's like it's like you know there's gonna come a time where people kind of all i think we, we uh, at least i know myself i used to say something like there's like an inevitable almost like traumatic period that will have to happen where people are going to realize there are truths that are going on behind the scenes that yeah. they didn't know were going on. And no, 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 this doesn't mean that it has to be the craziest of the craziest truths of all time, but more even something as simple as undeniable proof that, that governments are you know not operating in your best interest. Yeah. Um, and it feels like that has happened. Yeah. That's the big one. Yeah. That governments aren't operating in our best interest and, especially with the COVID pandemic, like we've seen a whole awakening with that. And then there's that, there's UFOs, you know, official disclosure of UFOs mm -hmm. that's happening by governments. There's so many different topics that have come to light that were once considered like a conspiracy theory. And now they're pretty much undeniable and people know something is going on. So it's, it's definitely wild. So this leads to the, probably one of the big, the hardest parts of all this is that as more stuff comes true and as it's talked about, in let's say mainstream you have now this like almost like complete and utter doubt that any of it has any value or any of it is true because if the mainstream starts talking about something yeah. if the mainstream starts acknowledging something well it must be an agenda yeah and we, we see that happening a lot right now yeah which is unfortunate it's like oh anything that comes in the mainstream oh it can't be true which is like that's not true it, mainstream is basically used to like manipulate our perception of in many cases real events like look what happened in 9-11 mm -hmm. and look what mainstream did look at the chemical gas attacks in syria in 2016 like look how mainstream media portrayed those and um so we see whether or not like they're planned events that's a different discussion but we see real events and we see mainstream media twisting the perception of people yeah um Narrative control. Uh, narrative control. Just yeah. so, just because it's covered in the mainstream doesn't mean it didn't happen or it's not true or it's ultimate deception. It's more so the story behind it that's that's usually not true. But that you know that leads to the question of uh, Elon Musk, because yeah. I, know, I, I, I there's some people I can't even talk to about Elon Musk because it's like oh he's a troll he's a plant he's this he's a that and you know maybe so but there's you gotta provide evidence like I don't see how somebody's encouraging and helping free speech works in the government's favor like some people said uh, robert f kennedy jr was a, a controlled opposition but he's done a lot of damage to pharmaceutical companies and he's increased vaccine hesitancy 
a thousand fold. So, you know, I don't know. Well, I think, that. I think this is the problem with, with controlled, the question of controlled opposition mm-hmm. is there's no clear definition mm-hmm. of what boxes have to be checked for somebody to be controlled opposition. Mm-hmm. And there's never an agreement of who's controlled opposition was going. It just, I mean, we've been called controlled opposition. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. we've seen, like you said, RFK, you know, Elon Musk, uh, Alex Jones, like all, like any and every Joe Rogan. Yeah. Uh, controlled opposition. The, the controlled everybody's opposition <laughs> crowd. Everybody's controlled opposition. Everybody who controlled has a voice or who gets popular and some. Yeah. Russell some, Brand controlled opposition. Everyone. Yeah. Right. But, but like you said, when you start to, you know, okay, so how do you know this or what evidence would there be that this is controlled opposition? It becomes a much more tricky subject. Um, And I think that's where a lot of people are with, with Elon um, in owning Twitter and and that whole thing is it's like, first it's, it's, well, look at his family. His family's like super wealthy, you know, have all these uh, ties to, um, you know, gem and and all the diamond uh, mines, diamond mining and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, and you know, the, the connections to uh, technocratic um, sort of ideas and all these sorts of stuff back in the day. And so it's like, right. But how do you know that there's in this particular case, he might actually be trying to restore. Yeah, exactly. You know, and and it's like, speech. it's like the Dalai Lama and Sudguru, for example, I recently wrote an article about the Dalai Lama and his thoughts on life elsewhere. Yeah. And, um, because the Dalai Lama supported vaccines and he's done some like, and Sudguru supports vaccines, for example, people are like controlled, opposition. controlled opposition, or it's like, I don't trust this guy. People don't really in the possible get in their heads that the possibility is that okay these people like i have people in my family who thought the vaccines were awesome there's tons of great people out there who think covid19 vaccines are extremely effective and safe and life-saving yeah so how do how do they know how do they know that people like the dalai lama or Sadhguru, their hearts aren't in the right place just because they support a covid19 vaccine or something you may not agree with doesn't mean they're a bad person it means they may have a different perspective so there's all these like things you got to think about there. Yeah, and, and I think same thing with Elon Musk. Like, I think the question is, is like, what do we gain? And this is this is, I think, the question that has come up the most in some of my coverage of Elon, um, is like, what do we gain from just saying, don't listen to anything Elon is doing, don't use Twitter, don't even fall for it because it's, it's just a, an agenda, it's just a trick, it's a bait and switch. Mm-hmm. I, I, the reason why I don't understand what we gain from saying that is like is are we of the belief that nothing will ever change or nothing can ever get better and that any person that appears even remotely you know uh sort of bad in some way shape or form Mm -hmm. as long as they as soon as they touch something it just taints that thing forever like I, i don't i don't know what we gain it seems like it from that whole perspective at the end of the day yeah like it seemed that 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 perspective is it pops up everywhere how would you be able to know though if like what what would people look for in terms of oh it's a bait and switch he's he's making you like him by restoring stuff on twitter uh so that later he can you know take all your data and and make you wear brain implants you know that kind of stuff happens with powerful people there's no doubt about it that you know um, um, but yeah, like the bait and switch. So his, it's, uh, you, it's not like you can see his intentions. Like we right. can't see his intentions, but, uh, to make you accept Neuralink this and that. And like, I don't know, I, I personally have issues with Neuralink and like the animal testing and the safety of it. And, um, you know, it can, it be controlled from an outside sources and that, and yeah, yeah there are questions, but me personally, I feel Elon is just passionate about that stuff. And that's who he is as a person. Mm-hmm. Um, that's his passion. Uh, I don't think he has any ill intent. But then again, I don't know. I can't say it. But um, you can't say he does. Like, there's no proof either way. And it's just like, like you said, everyone who becomes big and has a voice and does things. It's like you're, you're stuck either way. Either someone's going to do something bad something like censorship control be in support of mandates and then everyone who's big who opposes that like elon or something like is automatically controlled opposition and they're working for the same team right. like i just there's just no evidence behind it you know it's yeah and I, people would argue i think they'd say oh well look at the connections to the you know the, the grandfather and the you know yeah. technocratic future uh, those ideas look at look at the you know world economic forum connections like they'll they'll say that yeah right but then it's, uh, and I get it, like, it's like you have to look at some of those bits of evidence and you have to consider that stuff. It's just, it's this idea of like, what if 
he decides, you know what, I don't like the future Klaus Schwab is, is going after, or mm -hmm. I, no, I don't like what's happening. And it's like he, you know, has been outspoken about Trudeau. He's been outspoken about uh, the U.S. government. Yeah. He's been outspoken about so many things. And it's like, is the, I guess the theory is that he's outspoken about all these things just to trick people, right? Someone, yeah, someone the brought up the idea that in order for the, um, you know, World Economic Forum's plan of the Great Reset to go through, mm -hmm. they have to uh, get everybody to hate government. And then once everybody hates government through guys like Elon Musk, mm -hmm. right, um, they can then usher in a new plan and a new future. Mm -hmm. However, I don't think actually reading the book and going through the world economy, I don't think that is at all what the plan no, would be. No, their plan is to restore trust in government exactly. hard. And, and a lot of good people are like... A lot of people can be members of the World Economic Forum and Council on Foreign Relations and be good people and not really be aware of the stuff we're aware of, for example. Mm -hmm. Like I have a friend who's, well, I went to a guy, went, was friends with a guy in high school who's like becoming a high up politician in Canada right now. And mm -hmm. he believes in everything. Like they're, the call him, yeah, the system, call him brainwash, call him whatever you want. But they're like, you could consider them walking drones for the World Economic Forum who actually believe in increasing um um like combating vaccine hesitancy with more censorship because yeah. that's a good thing like right. people's hearts are human beings when it comes to brainwashing their hearts are captured because you can't make a human being in most insta instances in my opinion do a bad thing so what you do is you capture their hearts you yeah. make them think they're doing something good like i look at a lot of my family members with covid 19 vaccine mandates and ridiculing those who disagreed like they're not bad people. Yeah. They, they thought this was for this. So, you know, you see what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah, it's so slow... not everyone who's a member of the World Economic Forum is part of this evil agenda. There's there's tons of members of Council of Foreign Relations, World Economic Forum. But I do think in the high ups, the Klaus Schwab's and the certain connections with politicians like Justin Trudeau, I think there is massive corruption there. And yeah, stuff I... that we probably can't even imagine. Um, but yeah, I think what they're what they're trying to Sorry, do. Sorry, I got off topic there. No, no, that's it's on topic. I mean, what they're what it seems like they're they're trying to do is create a culture, and then mm -hmm. and then get that culture out into politicians, out into yes. other people, and, and stigmatize those that disagree with it, exactly. and talk out against it. Yeah, and they may not know that what sort of they're part of, but I think the challenge is, is that I think a lot of them do. I think some but of them do. Many don't. Yeah. Yeah, but but yeah, some of them absolutely do. I think some don't. Yeah. And I think the challenge is, is that w w the frame of just saying, well, anybody that has any tie whatsoever to anything, mm -hmm. okay, so just because there's a tie, like for example, you have a picture of of let's say Russell Brand with Hillary Clinton. Oh, well, now we have yeah. proof that that Russell Brand is controlled opposition because yeah. he's in a picture. That's with, the same thing with, that happened with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. He was right. in this picture and i think jeffrey epstein was in the back background or same with elon musk i think with Ghislaine maxwell you have yeah. all the, like yeah and it's like the picture now equals x right and yeah. it's like it, it's so easy for that to happen and you don't really know or, and i think this is this is the challenge is it's like are we interested in actually finding out what the truth is and what is going on or are we captured by a narrative about what is happening and then we're just fitting all of the pieces of what we see into that narrative and just kind of and then run with it, you know, running with it. Yeah. Right. And, and I think because my, my issue is I think what's happening with the world economic forum and their plan of a great reset and trying to do with it, like everybody can see, I think if they take a step back and look that, that something is going on, they're trying to do something right. Yeah. They're trying to use this opportunity. They're trying to use every opportunity to, to push forward towards what they've been trying to create. Right. The challenge is, how are you going to discern what their plan and idea is mm -hmm. from what, say, my ideas are? I write a ton of ideas around how we can use technology uh, to better our world, uh, how we can um, utilize uh, better voting systems, democratic on the blockchain, mm -hmm. to create better democracies, uh, how we can uh, create societies where... We don't necessarily need to work 24 seven where we could have different ways of automation. Like right. how are you going to discern the difference between these ideas and the world economic and the world economic because form? Because they're pretty much the same. Because they're pretty much yeah, the and, same. And if you, if, if I told someone, a friend, for example, 
on the far left, let's say yeah. about world economic plans, like they'd be like, Oh, this sounds great. We got to do this for climate change. We right. got to do this to decrease vaccine hesitancy. Like they think it's great. Yeah. And, and like you said, the stuff you talk about, it's yeah. At the, at the end of the day, people, I think like you and me see through certain things and realize that, okay, based on history and track records of organizations like this, like these measures are done under the, as I've written many times under the guise of goodwill <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, and that's what, people like me for example are worried about that you know they're they're using crisis ease and sometimes create them in order to propose a solution that's not actually what's best for humanity but serves another agenda of power and control and yeah. stuff like that and we see that and we see that creeping into our society more and more every day and um you know, but some people just call that a conspiracy theory, but I think there's good evidence for it, obviously. Yeah, yeah. for sure. I mean, there's, and, and I think, again, this goes back to the challenges. It's like in the future, if I were to very sort of quickly, and this is not necessarily fair because the great reset's a very large idea, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, it seems as though what they're trying to propose and create is a world in which they get to decide the terms as to yes. what the world looks like moving forward mm -hmm. with, you know, addressing the, the needs of inequality, addressing the, you know, food scarcity, addressing um, poverty, addressing uh, having a meaningful life and living a meaningful life. Yeah. But, you know, those who are rich and powerful now are going to call all the shots, are going to still be rich and powerful in the future. And you're just going to have yeah. to kind of And it's almost it. like they, these problems are, because a lot of these problems, we already have the ability and potential to fix. Right. In my opinion, easily. So, um, and yeah, you can only, they're going to, frame these things in a way that they're absolutely necessary and like what are we going to do we powerless people like but at the end of the day you can only push people so far it's but, like you saw with the mandates right yeah. look at the uprising so if they have to frame it in a way where people will agree and think it's good because if they don't they're going to have trouble and uprising on their hands abs and, absolutely you know, but, so but they, it's not easy for them either here's but. the part that gets tricky is their 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 vision is under more in exchange for all the surveillance, all the control, mm -hmm. all this centralized node essentially that is able to track, you know, people as literally a serial number, and and that being mm -hmm. like we're all just, uh, let's say, inventory in this mm -hmm. new great reset system in exchange yeah. for for this world that might be more equal or whatever. We we need this level of control, this level of of granule surveillance, granule control. Yeah. Um, which obviously has its its negatives and its downsides that you know we could talk about all day long with regards to being able to turn off somebody's access to all their money just like yeah, that yeah, or yeah. which we kind of have now but but imagine it on a whole nother yeah, level like you could drive your spend car anything. too far they'll shut your car off yeah. and, and all these things i can understand the rules it. like they did with the freedom convoy they shut down bank accounts yeah. like this is just a taste of what they want to do in the future so but my issue is is it's like at the end of the day what what it starts to feel like to me is like okay that is their vision their vision is okay you need to have all this surveillance and all this mm -hmm. control but like how like somebody else who has ideas for example like think of the venus project right mm -hmm. the venus project was suggesting that and i'm not saying this is a perfect idea but this is, it was a very good idea it was a great attempt at at, at sharing how we could remodel our society different mm -hmm. technological futures no necess necessity for money yeah, yeah. Um, using resources well here's the thing if you had a resource-based economy you would require that those resources are tracked somehow in some sort of central system that is knowing and tracking and distributing and figuring out how yeah. all these resources. But the, so you, you need these technologies. But the consciousness behind the technology is the difference. And this is the this is the problem. So if if you like, it's not that the, we've said many times before. It's not the technology and the methods, the neural links, the tracking, this and that. Like these can be used to benefit humanity yeah. if we used them the right way. Like, um, but um, you know, it's the consciousness behind these technologies. That's the problem. So, so then this leads to my issue is that my, right now our technological development is harming us because it's not being used for the, and it's purposes. not being done ethically. Yeah. I, I agree. Like for example, social media is an incredible tool, but it can be used unethically. Right. Mm -hmm. But so my issue is this, what, what's being built right now is a, a lack of sort of this complex form of thinking where you're asking the question of like, how do we move forward technologically, for example, but responsibly? Instead, what, what I'm seeing is anything that sounds even remotely 
like it could be used negatively. Like David Icke told this to Adam Curry uh, mm-hmm. during a dinner. Uh, you know, Adam was was talking about his his. Uh, for people who don't know, Adam Curry is, um, <clears throat> you know, basically like consciousness scientist has done a lot of incredible work um, in the field of consciousness and worked with Dean Radin uh, mm-hmm. pretty closely. The Paralab at, at Princeton. And, mm-hmm. um, was it Princeton? Uh, no, I think so. Was it Wasn't Princeton? It Princeton. Oh, jeez, I, so. I don't want to misquote that one. But um, Institute of Noetic Sciences. Anyway, yeah. but they were having a dinner, and he was talking about you know his technologies with regards to consciousness, basically utilizing a cell phone mm-hmm. and some of the the technologies in a cell phone to pick up on uh, act, use it like a random number generator to pick on situations of potential significance in the field of consciousness, right? So it was a really fascinating idea. And I remember David's perspective uh, that he told Adam is like, there's no way in which technology and consciousness should ever be used together because technology will always, like it'll always produce a negative outcome. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's interesting because that doesn't even align with what David has written in some of his books about when he talks about consciousness and he talks about how it's the way in which that, we need to rethink, right? It's like right. we could have, it, it, there's this fear where anything that sounds like it could be linked to the Great Reset, anything that sounds like it could be used in a negative way, we now have to throw out the window because right. it's automatically going to be used in a negative well, way. Well, maybe it will. The, well, the, the, the way the humans are right now, it absolutely can. We, can. Because uh, just thinking like, I always go to ET contact stories and there's a lot mm-hmm. of contact stories about us like the REL school encounter. Yeah. All those kids were beamed into their head. We need to stop developing technologically. And they're not the only ones. Our mm-hmm. technology is destroying us. And that's because of human nature. I don't know if humans it's our nature. Humans don't have the capacity. Yeah, we don't have the, we're not ready yet for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, we build bombs and kill people and use things to control people. Like, I understand what you're saying. Like, you know, if like for Neuralink, for example, um, Everyone thinks these kind of technologies all of a sudden are nefarious and yeah. support an evil agenda. But I think in many cases, people are developing these things with good intentions. But well, they, they might be trying to help paralyze people. Yeah, for exactly. Example. Like there's a lot of good things we could do yeah. with these technologies. It, it, all, it all boils down back to human consciousness and like what we use it for and um, that kind of thing. Like the, the consciousness, the person, the morals and ethics behind these technologies. Uh, are there always going to be people on earth who are just power hungry and con- want control and, you know, are evil? Are, are these people always going to exist or will we one day have an earth where like we have leaders and everyone is just all about service to others and there's no such thing as greed and service to self and this and that. Cause mm-hmm. if we had a, if we were a pure race of amazing beings who just cared about everything and everyone and all life, we wouldn't have to worry about our technological development. It'd be a good thing. Right. Absolutely. So that, that, that's, that's what it, that's where it's at. You so know, this humans is, are just fucked. So this, just is, <laughs> 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 fuck. so this is, this there's is a the, lot of good of humans, is. but there's a lot of, we're in an interesting species. Yeah, we are. And, and I think the reason why this conversation is so important around this particular topic is because it's here, right? Like it's, mm-hmm. it's happening. Yeah. We have, we have, it's no longer it's five years, 10 years down the road. Like yeah. all of this stuff is happening right now. And at the end of the day, it's this question of, I, I don't I, like, honestly, I think the majority of human beings, like 98% are good. Are good. Yes, like uh, people but, I know in my life that they all have like, yeah, you know, some quote unquote bad people, but we all have that light spark in us. And it's just a select few that are just, but I don't know here's also what on. I find. Like, for example, you could have somebody. So, so going back to this question of like, are people good? Yes. But do they understand what their actions are doing at times? No. Or do they understand the nature of our systems? I think sometimes no. Mm-hmm. Like, like, for example, we accept a lot of things as, well, that's just normal. Normal, yeah. When in reality, it's that that's because <laughs> that's part of our economic system, say, right? Like the idea of competing to destroy your counterpart in business is normal yeah right survival of the fittest because yeah because that's just who we are as people and that's what that's bullshit the, that's the world view yeah. right so what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is yes people are sort of good people but it the world view and the thinking around what we're doing is because there's not there's a lack of introspection and mm-hmm. there's a lack of sort of a, the, the depth of like are like why is it why does it take so long for people to realize that their actions have downline destructive effects, mm-hmm. right? Why did it take people so long 
to, to realize that, okay, for example, in our current economic system, if you have wealthy people in the West that are doing fine and they're wealthy, by design, it typically means that there has to be people on the planet that are extremely poor, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just the, the nature of our economic system yeah, is yeah. that debt is an inherent aspect of it that has to pr produce a, yeah. la a lack of abundance, a scarcity, right? So on and so forth. Yeah. So our systems it's, it's are messed that, up. But they're not, they're messed up. But it's it's not that people are that they have to be good or bad. It's that people are unaware of how the systems themselves are creating the problems that they're trying to fix, mm -hmm. right? And so so my question is is you yeah, asked you brought up something interesting, which was the idea of you know will one day humans kind of have this new level of consciousness, new level mm -hmm. of being? And my thing is it's like because we're right here on the precipice of like these technologies are coming, these technologies are here. Um, this great reset is gaining steam, right? If like I see it as like if we always say no, these technologies mm -hmm. are scary, we can't go near them, whatever, blah, blah, right. blah, because our consciousness, uh, because humans will misuse it. Mm -hmm. Where in that conversation is, well, hold on a second, how do we prepare ourselves to use these com these technologies, right? If we're, if it's always just yeah. throw it away, I don't want to talk about it because it's yeah. bad and evil. Where are we bringing awareness to the fact that, that this is what needs to grow is our capacity to use these technologies ethically? Yeah, I don't know, because like for me, it's always like, a small group of people control how these things are used and what's going to be done with them. Like the people who control these systems. So it's like, it's not the people it's, it's, it's basically like if you like our phones and all this stuff, mass surveillance, mm -hmm. like the people don't have a choice of how they want to use surveillance. It's like the government, right. you know, because yeah, there is who, no real democracy or whoever. Yeah. Controls these. So I always grapple with the question, like, like, is it, can we really do anything? Do the people can like, when, when we give so much power over to s s a few group of people who basically control everything, like, what can we do about that? They're the ones that call all the shots. They're the one that decide what technology is allowed, what technology is and, and how we use it with their regulation and stuff. Yeah. So it's like, you know, this is the crux of everything, yeah. right? This is, this is the conversation that is both so hard to have, but also so necessary to have very difficult to wrap our minds around because it is a massive question that doesn't have a clear linear path to a solution. Mm -hmm. It is like, it is like saying, well, we need some of these technological innovations. We, we need systems change, mm -hmm. but we, we don't have any power as people. That's what we believe, right? We don't have any power as people. Right. Be, and I think it's technically, mainly, technically we do. Like if, if I agree. we all decided to just go up and end ever, all these systems and, just do things ourselves right. somehow. But how do you know, get but, that to happen? Yeah, how like, do you get people to come together? Yeah. How do you get people to have conversations and agree yeah. on things? Everyone's right? comfortable. They're living for themselves. They want jobs. They want pensions. They right. want to live within the system. We've been in the system, these systems so long that we're comfortable with them. And when you try and take a, someone away from that, it's uncomfortable. Like, yeah. So it's like... Like I talk to people all the time about this question. And what is typically... I always comes back as the answer is... Like, I think about these things. I feel these things. I know what you're saying, mm -hmm. but where do we start? What do we do? I mean, we I, need a mass catastrophe to happen. So we all have to force to start. <laughs> I joking. mean, I mean, I that, that, that is, happens, that but. is, that's been a narrative that we've seen in every movie and, and, you know, book and whatever. But yeah. I, I think the, the challenges is, and maybe I'm getting, you know, I, I've often thought about this too, because I'm like, well, am I you know, am I one of maybe not that many people that are actually interested in doing this right now? Meaning like right. my thoughts around this idea, mm -hmm. maybe they're ahead of its time and maybe legitimately deep down within people that they don't want really to have a, a large wholesale change in the systems that we have. Yeah. Maybe they're, they're like, you know what? Sure. I, I just fully want to do this. And I would challenge by saying, okay, hold on. Do you convince yourself that you want to do this? Or do you mm. really, truly, honestly, in your heart, when you set everything aside, is this, is this how you want to really keep living? Yeah. Because right? To be, well, to be honest, like I asked myself the same question, like what if I could have, you know, if I can make a decent living and have a comfortable life and do things that I enjoy here and there, be it sports or whatever, and have friends and have, you know, a little bit of freedom, not really care about the world. Mm -hmm. How selfish it sounds. 
I mean, we've our whole basis of doing what we do is because we cared about we won't, we had a deep desire to make change. And 15 years into this, I I almost start to desire. Okay, I've spent 15 years doing this. I want to kind of enjoy myself now and live that life if mm-hmm. if it's even possible somehow. I don't know. Yeah. And it's like, and that life in itself is hard. Like most people don't make enough money to do anything and yeah. can barely pay their bills and stuff. So it's tough, but like everybody wants strives for that financial freedom, quote unquote, and to just do these things and not care about the world. And it's, it's very intriguing to think about. Yeah. Because it's, 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 it's you it's, don't want to be a martyr. Yeah. Right. The, the idea is you want to be a martyr. You don't want to, you don't want to be trying so hard at this, that it stresses you out to the point of, you know, oh my God, we need, we need to force the change. Right. Yeah. I, and I, so I, so it's like, I get that. And I felt that before I've been in that place where I'm almost like, you know, you're, you're, you're almost like, we got to make this happen. Mm-hmm. Um, however, it's interesting because I have a drive, right? Like I feel like that thing you were talking about, what started C way back and why we've been doing this for 15 mm-hmm. years is like this drive, this sort of desire to put this message out into the world. Mm-hmm. And, you know, does there need to be a result and how quickly right, like, right. that's the part that's hard I, to sometimes. Yeah. I've uh, earlier, I was like, okay, things are going to change. We're going to see results. Yeah. Things have changed and with the consciousness of people, but this and that, but I'm starting to realize that I'm more, I'm fine with making a contribution mm-hmm. to this world. And if, and even if things change at 500,000 years from now, 500,000 or whatever, yeah, I, I want to, do some what I feel in my heart is good and put that out into the world and and not worry so much about hoping things change quick and this and yeah. that and maybe even realizing that things may not change. Mm-hmm. Maybe, but I don't know. I don't know the future and I just want to do something that I feel is good, you know, and yeah. just not kind of be so miserable down and depressed at the state of the world and, you know, life and this and that. So, I mean... Yeah, I, I don't know, because I, I used to get so discouraged that the world's not going to change, and even now, I feel like the government's always going to do what they do. But I do see encouraging signs because mm-hmm. you can only, like I said earlier, you can only push people so far. Yeah, people will rise up, and they'll. Governments can only do so much when that happens. For sure, you know, we saw that with mandates and protests and everything. So it's like if they don't figure out how to frame certain things is really good, and actually have people trust government which they think they can do. People every year are losing trust in the government. Yet more. the World Economics yeah. Forum, like, we're going to restore We're going to rebuild it. Like, I, sometimes I think these people who are trying to do these things are completely clueless about the consciousness of the planet and where people are at. Um, and they just keep doing their thing and then they get hit and realize, oh, you know. Well, if you believe that consciousness... Eventually everyone's going to disagree with some measure. For sure. Uh, but, and and if you, but if you, if you believe that consciousness tends towards evolution, like mm-hmm. it's, it's always evolving, mm-hmm. then that would be that would be the case that they, they are playing a role in essence in this game yeah. of earth and that it, is always going to awaken people yeah and, and it's creating a reaction sure and it's happening the yeah. consciousness of planning is shifting big time so sure. as much as i said things aren't going to change like the, this shift in consciousness that's happening it's cha- these kind of shifts in consciousness they lead to change somehow i don't know how sure. But yeah. years and years, they, they eventually lead to change. Yeah. And it, it's a it's a long, long process. It takes a lot of time, but it's happening rapidly, you know. It could take a hundred years and that and yeah. that's fine. I think my my main my main question with this is still um I I believe and this is why I bring up the question that we brought up that sort of got us here, was was I believe that part of the issue is that there's not enough sort of awareness and conversation around the idea of like what are we going to do to develop the the whether you want to call it ethics or the state of being the state Mm -hmm. of of mind the state of of our worldview what are we going to do there because most of uh, my honest opinion is most of these things are are already innate within us to be to be ethical, to not be destructive, to not be, I, I believe, I believe a lot of these are learned behaviors through our environment and our culture and our systems. Yeah. And, and right? if you think, sorry to cut you off, but like, you think people go to war, like they don't want to be there. <laughs> no, they don't want to be there. But a lot of them think well, they're doing what is morally and ethically right. That's the key. Yes. Humans, most of us do things 
that we think are morally and ethically right, but may not actually be. So it's all about like, yeah. And we're, but we're convinced we have no, we have no other option. Exactly. And that's right. my point is like, where, where do we start to converse about, you know, and make, and make a, a larger, like there's a, the people who made the social dilemma, mm-hmm. they're trying to have a conversation around the idea of, of utilizing, embracing and creating technology, including social media and so on and so forth. That is that is ethically sound, right. right? And and that that thinks about and this is this is the key and I think this is what it comes back to. I think we need to move from like this surface level thinking mm-hmm. that's within our culture where we just kind of look at something and say whether it's good or bad. Mm-hmm. Move get like like set that out of our culture. Like try and 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 not be so simple about things and instead embrace the complexity of what is our world and our condition our human condition even if it's only one subject that you do that with because that's the one you're most interested in you don't have to do about the whole world but just one subject which is why i say listen to episodes one through seven of the ce podcast (laughs) because i talk about a lot of this but um if even if you can embrace that complexity we can i think have much more useful conversations around this right it's like this does evolution if of our consciousness take a really long time because it needs to take a really long time and what i mean by that is because that is just the framework of consciousness or is it that because we're choosing to not listen to ourselves we're choosing to not engage from a deeper state of beingness but instead we're just kind of robotically moving through things no matter how much we're invited to do it differently because we just keep going back to the old and back to the old and back to the old is it slowing down the evolution of of these conversations meaning the door is open the opportunity is on the table for us to have these conversations more deeply Mm -hmm. but we keep getting sucked back into the drama of of the fight and the this and the that and whatever which which is surface level right do you know what i'm saying like is it clear what i'm trying to get across like the idea here is is yes evolution i'm I'm not i'm not trying to say we need to put so much pressure on like we have to get change to happen tomorrow and Mm -hmm. blah blah blah. what i'm saying is i can't see how if if we don't culturally start embracing the the necessity for shifting and 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 decentering and pulling back and and questioning our worldviews and questioning why we're so certain about things that we can't be certain about Mm -hmm. if we're not going to take the step to do that which i believe will speed up evolution Mm -hmm. in individuals and the collective then yes i would agree we're going to be here for hundreds and hundreds of years fighting about the same old crap yeah what i'm saying is i believe the door is open it's just i think people need to start taking the step and not it's sort of like this how do you know what's relevant in your world, right? Mm. Is it the most popular thing, right? If because a documentary comes out and gets 15 million views, does it mean that that documentary is relevant? Does it mean that that documentary has some truth to it? Or is it getting, are we getting caught up in it emotionally, mm. right? Versus right, right, right. being able to see that that documentary, yeah, may have been super popular, but how is it actually serving us? How, what is it, like, what is uh, this actually what's doing? What's that COVID documentary called again? Sudden. Oh, died suddenly. Died suddenly. Yeah, it's kind of. It's a. It's not a good argument for the topic. Yeah. Right. And it can hurt those who are trying to bring awareness to actual vaccine harms and injuries and. Right. Yeah. yeah. So the so the question. There's is, a lot of stuff like that out there. A lot yeah. Of, yeah, yeah. And I think I think this is where Manava makes a, an interesting point. Sometimes, um, you know, sort of having this bias. Mm-hmm. of leg- legitimacy come up of importance come up based on what the majority is looking at and what the majority is is interested in right mm-hmm. meaning I, I don't know that just because something is popular it's necessarily the right thing but because 100 but yeah. because we are um i i, I don't want to i don't want to place a a label on what's happening for each person because i think it's different but because we're not let's just say taking a step back from the situation and saying, is this actually relevant and good, regardless of what mm-hmm. the collective is is saying, oh yeah, this is important. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, it's very easy to get caught up in what the collective or pop culture is claiming is popular and what yeah. your attention should be on. Yeah, Because we know there are mechanisms at play that are unnatural that are meant to hijack our consciousness and create the idea that this is really popular and important, but it's mm-hmm. not. And 
<clears throat> something like um, um no, I mean. something like uh what's the doc sudden died suddenly yeah um like I, you mentioned controlled opposition i was thinking like okay <laughs> maybe died suddenly is controlled opposition because it gives governments easy an easy way to increase censorship and this and that and it gives them an easy way to point out and show how certain things are false and and or you can't really make these conclusions based on that like Maybe it's accidental controlled opposition. I don't know. Well, I, that's and, kind of an I, off topic. There's been a, there's been a couple. That's think, why it's so important to do things properly, critical think. And yeah. there's more than enough proper evidence out there to show with regards to yes, COVID vaccines yeah. already that there are many concerns and sure. in a credible way, yeah. not such a sensationalist um, kind of maybe even a misleading way. Yeah. Um, so, well, I, I mean, mean, and you see it on both sides. You see in the mainstream legacy media side, you see it in an alternative um, side, like it's, tales of two extremes and they're yeah. both they both serve each other in a way kind of i don't know sure it's, they're yeah. they're if again if you look at it from a consciousness mirroring perspective mm -hmm. it, they're mirroring each other yeah. right like think 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 of it this way and then we get categorized into the it pulls everybody in yeah right Who, and, and, and yeah this this illustrates the breakdown of the conversation and why the conversations can't be had but right. <laughs> think of it this way beginning of covid <clears throat> beginning of covid we had modeling come out mm -hmm. that created a hysterical perspective oh. as to what was going on with COVID and how bad it would be. Yeah, it was right? crazy. Yeah. That modeling was not based on any good evidence or data. No. It was bad modeling. And it was the basis for lockdowns and everything. And yeah. And then even as the truth came out, that that created a, an emotional sentiment, an emotional extremity that took a large group of people a very long time to sort of come out of. And there's still people who are still very, very much in it. That was hysteria. Mm -hmm. Okay, right now what's happening with, in my view, and some people might disagree with me and that's okay, but I see the exact same thing happening on the, uh, it, we'll say the extreme vaccine cautionary side. So, so I, there, are, there are reasons to question the, the nature of this vaccine and, and oh, the yeah. damage that there is, 100%. that it is causing. Yeah. But there's the same level of modeling based evidenceless hysteria as we saw with the COVID. As we saw, yeah. it's the same mirror. I would and it's agree with that. The same dehumanization that we saw with anybody who didn't wear a mask and was unvaccinated is mm -hmm. now the same dehumanization of anybody who doesn't agree with me and who is vaccinated. Right. It's the same dehumanization. I would largely agree with that. Although I do think <clears throat> I am more pulled towards the vaccine dangers and so am concerns I. So a lot. Am I. I'm concerned but about it. It is kind of the same. I'm concerned about it as well, but not like this is the challenge is if I said to you, are you concerned about the COVID vaccine? Right. right. And you would say, yes, I it's, could, it's, it's, I could put you like anywhere on a spectrum of like, you are, you believe like 3 billion people are going to die. Mm -hmm. You believe that the government designed it to kill people or right. you, or you say, you know what? I think it, this might've been, this might be like the opioid, opioid crisis where you have a, a bad pharmaceutical product mm -hmm. that wasn't tested properly and wasn't well thought out and you're unnecessarily yeah. harming people are you harming like you know 30 40 50 for 70 70 80 90 percent of people i mean i don't know but yeah you're at least harming like probably three to five seven percent of people which that, is a shitload which is a people. lot of people right yeah. so so what i'm saying is there's this massive spectrum anywhere yeah. in there and and my my general point is when i look at this conversation and I look at the importance of sense making when it comes to this conversation, meaning the good sense making, which is actually trying to look at the total picture of what, like again, decentering, taking a step back, look at the total picture of what's going on mm -hmm. and figuring out little pieces of the details here so that we can know how to move forward and, and know how to hold government accountable and whatever yeah. it is that we need to do. You're not going to get there with extreme views no. on either and it, side, and it's always the extreme views that get popular that and get put popular. out there. And it's the ones in the middle or or whoever's doing something properly, never get any attention. So it's like, uh, can we ever really do that, well, or is it always going to be a is, battle of extremes? This is the question, and we're right? going to forever play this out, and we'll never change. I think <laughs> with awareness, people start to. They, what happens, right? You raise awareness about this very question, right? Mm -hmm. Some people have accused me when I bring up this question of of things like, and again, this is a fair accusation. I'm not going to say that they're wrong in, in accusing me, but um, they'll say, well, we shouldn't we shouldn't worry about, you know, the, the quote unquote the people on our side mm -hmm. that are too extreme. We should just you know focus on 
doing doing the right thing and i say well, like look i don't i don't see this as sides we're mm -hmm. humanity moving forward that's it right we're humanity mm -hmm. trying to move forward what i'm saying is if we don't raise awareness about how bad our collective sense making is mm -hmm. we can't fix it right so to have the conversation about how bad our collective sense making is yeah requires it's, us to say what are the elements uh, that make our sense making bad? yeah because it's becoming a huge problem just like whatever it could be any other topic child trafficking this and that that you want to create awareness about our lack of ability to make sense about things is just another problem that's hurting us from moving forward um, as a collective as a collective not yeah. not just a side or my argument versus yours or, yeah, yeah, and yeah. and this is this is the point you know i think it's episode uh, three of the c podcast that everybody should go back and listen to um but no but this is the point is it's like i think until we can start to understand the reason why i did those first seven episodes was i wanted to try and contribute to the conversation a that there's sort of like almost like this ecology of meta crises that are involved in why the world is currently the way it is and offer some sort of conversation starting point as to how we can start moving forward that isn't just let's just you know fight to arrest the people that did this to us with covid right, right? that is fine if you if you want to play to hold accountable the government that's fine the question is is I have those people, I see doctors who are saying that, which I'm like, okay, I agree with your with your spirit of saying that. We'll also go out there and say, uh, my estimation at this point is that uh, the vaccine has killed 220 million people mm -hmm. or something like crazy like this. And you're like, so, so well, this is the problem. Is that crazy? 220 million people? Is 220 million people a lot out of 8 billion? Uh, that's a huge number. What's that? In I don't percentage? even. I, we'd have to actually look at the numbers, but I don't think anywhere close to that many people died in you know COVID. I don't think stuff that how many. Last... I don't think two hundred twenty million people have died from the vaccine. One hundred percent. I don't yeah. think that. But I think, like, given the mechanisms of action with the vaccine and what can go on, I think we're never gonna know. Well, like somebody could have the vaccine, this vaccine when they're twenty, and they could die when they're fifty as a result of the vaccine. Yeah. So. Uh, I, I, w I was giving an example. Um, I'm not. But yeah, know, 220 we're, million is. I was ridiculous. giving an example to sort of. Uh, let me just let me just look at something really quick. Um, <clears throat> For those listening, sometimes Joe and I disagree on certain things. Well, yeah, I mean, not, I'm we, not disagreeing that 200 million, 20 people. I don't think 220 million people have died from the vaccine. Like that'd be a huge story, yeah. like massive amount of that many people dying all the everywhere. Who are vaccinated? Jesus, I can't. I can't. <laughs> I'm trying to just get one. One thing is for numbers. sure: there is a record number of deaths, hospitalizations, and permanent disabilities being reported as a result of these vaccines. But as far yeah, like that record number I, is like a couple million, um, and we don't even know how many of those are connected to the vaccine. But um, vaccine injury surveillance systems it's it's a few million yeah like yeah. So, so i don't know how someone can say to, this vaccine has killed 220 million right because even it's during just during, not yeah they're saying something like 13 this appears uh something around 13.5 million people between january 2020 and january 2021 mm -hmm. died uh associated with with covid um globally right so you you got to think and then when you're talking about excess deaths like there's some but there's not who said 220 million um i don't remember if it was 220 million my my, my point was that it, the when i ran the numbers yeah for what ex their exact words were it was like a literal impossibility mm -hmm. and my my question was to to that particular case and i know this is kind of kind of vague because i brought up an example that was just kind of like a as a, as an example um, my, my issue was, was like, we're, we're trying to make these big claims and, mm -hmm. and take serious accountability without taking serious the burden of proof and the burden of yes, evidence that 100%. would be required. And that's my general point is that I think we all agree. I mean, look what we've written about for the last two and a half years that we were oversold yeah. the safety of this vaccine yeah per period and and like, like lots of my articles i always use evidence so i'm like right. this vaccine has killed people yes but i don't say like like the most i'll go is okay look at the record number of amounts of deaths reported in vaccine injury surveillance systems but that's not even like i don't know it's i don't even think 
like if you take global i don't i don't even know if you'd even hit a million but but yeah it's yeah. but i mean not, you, if someone you, says like 220 million that's a little i don't again i don't remember the number yeah. my general point was that when i when i saw what they had said and then i looked at the numbers mm -hmm. and i ran i ran the numbers based on various injury rates and various uh death rates based on the amount of people not doses but people mm -hmm. that were uh, vaccinated globally right because you could say oh there was let's say a billion doses given out but a billion doses doesn't mean a billion people right because you some people are vaccinated yeah, yeah. three four times right um not only that but it's like you have mrna vaccines and then you and then, have yeah, yeah, yeah. non-mrna and those have different injury rates likely yes. right you know moderna has a different injury profile from from uh, uh pfizer to some extent right, right. But my point is, is it's like it, this, this, this conversation is like, it, it always comes back to when you ask for a clearer evidence or a way in which you could quantify this for people. So like people who are trying to understand this vaccine cautionary position are going to need evidence. They're going to need a clear explanation yeah. of what's going on. They're not going to go off of, well, haven't you seen that, you know, this athlete died and that person yeah, had this and exactly. that. That's, that's, that's not evidence. No. Right? And that I never, like, 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 I write a lot about vaccines. I know I would never use something like that because in my mind, I'm trying to convince someone who doesn't believe me or at right. least open their mind and open show them. So the I'm question. always using data and there's more than enough things like that out there to show that like, yeah, there are clear concerns with this vaccine. But when you say, look at all these people dying of, uh, look at all these athletes dying of sudden cardiac arrest. For example, I, I'm writing an article right now showing sudden cardiac um, deaths in competitive athletes was was a huge problem before COVID and the rollout. In mm -hmm. like 20, 2005, 2006, like 80 athletes died. Yeah. So like that's a lot. So like uh, so like if, if there's it's just not being televised now. Every every single death, every single death is, is put on. So it's like when you say look at all these athletes dying, like that's not. That's not a strong point. In fact, it does more harm and makes you look more non-credible, like you don't know how yeah, to... Yeah, I, I think at the know. end of the day, we have to get to the numbers, right? Yeah. So, and I think the problem is, is that... I So I, I'm like, still trying sorry, to figure yeah. out, just numbers-wise, for yeah. example, on has there been an increase in the athletes? And I've I've seen that there have been some reports of increases. The challenge is, is that if you go back pre-vaccine... Mm -hmm. You were from from COVID infection. You were seeing uh, increases in heart damage mm -hmm. in in top tier athletes. You were seeing um, universities and and high um, high com highly competitive uh, like uh, well let's say sports organizations mm -hmm. were telling their COVID recovering pre vaccine athletes to go easy after COVID because they right. were seeing elevated heart issues. Right? right. And my, my general point is, is the problem is, is like, even if you did start to have some excess, you need to be able to strip out those that were caused by COVID and those that were caused by the vaccine. And even though I believe the vaccine may be causing more. Yeah. Damage, I personally think the vaccine is, is way more dangerous than the COVID infection for heart damage. Personally. And I'm not, I'm not going to argue the hypothesis that it's more damage because mm -hmm. I think it is as well. The question is still, you know, you have both of these things going on mm -hmm. and but you're not seeing people dropping dead all over the place in your life you're mm -hmm. seeing these instances that occur and then we're making a massive deal about it and right. then it creates this this idea that it is so widespread and again i don't know how much cardiac death in athletes has increased compared to years prior i couldn't find that information I, but i've seen headlines I a, of like i have a link that might be helpful like for a that. thousand times more no i don't know if it's a thousand times more but i think it has increased okay I that's interesting you should send me that link yeah, yeah. we we gotta mind. we gotta look at that because i think i think it has increased mm -hmm. the question is um because i don't know how much exactly because it's a hard thing to answer yeah and i mean myocarditis is not just caused by COVID; it's caused by rsv it's caused by flus it's caused by like 70 different viruses yeah so it's like it's not a new phenomenon, but anyways yeah it's complicated um but yeah yeah at the, at the end of the day <laughs> that's the thing is you you work in this space you hear a word over and over and over again and you have to start making jokes about it otherwise it like loses all its meaning yeah. um but yeah i, I think I, again i the 
the struggle steve kirsch i got a i got his newsletter oh steve morning. kirsch i think that's <laughs> that's where i saw the increase in sudden cardiac death among athletes like a thousand times more or something i can't remember but. and and again what's what's interesting about steve is what's hard is at times he is taking his own data that he pulls from like surveys and stuff that he does with either his his group of people that read his new newsletter or other people problem is is like you're, you're going to have a very large sort of selection bias in your survey when you mm -hmm. do that right like yeah you, that's the way he's doing it yeah and so so he'll say like oh look i found this in my data and everybody's you know got to got to challenge you got to you got to prove that my data is wrong it's like and then somebody's just like steve like i you're you're passionate about this issue your intentions are great but like this can't be reproduced because you're you're asking a group of people that are already like convinced that there's an issue and that are that are there because they saw it. you have to you have to spread out and, and go right. to demographics all over the place. But I'm sure some of the stuff he puts out is Lots of stuff that he good. puts out. Because he amazing. is a scientist. Like Lots he's trained stuff. in yeah. right. Lots Wasn't of stuff. Wasn't he like he a prophet Yale or something? Um, I can't remember yeah. the, his total background. I'm not. He's like again, an epidemi epidemiologist before COVID. Th that's how he got popular. Yes, because he's a big epidemiologist that came out and. Yeah, the issue is not the issue is not. Hey, do we want to kill a source of information? Do we want to take them out again? This is this is the this is the thing. Is like people will say, well, this person is not credible because of X. Mm -hmm. It's more so when when the person's evidence or example in a specific case doesn't make sense don't use that as a right like put that one aside and mm -hmm. keep where they have their signal and and put the noise aside right yeah. and that's and that's kind of the, the sentiment here is like um he the one from this morning was about celine dion you know and it was something like 99.6 percent sure celine dion you know got this from uh from the covid vaccine, yeah. uh, from the vaccine and it's like well the problem is is nowhere publicly is there any indication of when Celine started having these uh, right. symptoms? Right. And the, the that, thing, the thing is, like, it's okay to discuss. It's that's not, the point. Like, so if I were to write an article about Celine Dion, I'd look at like, I'd go back and look at the, you know, the early war, early risks of COVID vaccines. Like, yeah. there was a, that Freedom of Information Act document released that showed what the complications are and what Celine Dion has now, if that's on that list, then I'd be like, Hmm, that's interesting. Then I go look at when she got her vaccine. Hmm, that's interesting. And then you can kind of make, you can be like, Oh, you, you can know, start somewhere. You can speculate I, like that. That's, I think that's reasonable to do, but if you're going to come out and say, Oh, this is because of the vaccine without any well, I think connection the from is, the vaccine to her condition. Sure. Then the challenge is too, is it's like, okay, even if it is, so, so Celine has this, like, how like how how common it, again it comes back to being able to take these in when you take these individual stories and you spotlight them mm -hmm. it can make things sound really huge right, <clears throat> right. the question is still always has to land on like what is this in the totality the contextualization of of this whole discussion right the context the context is like how you can mislead people with narrative capture and mm -hmm. and you know that like this is this is how this this goes which is why for me it's like i, I don't think I don't think we've used any like right. celebrity focus or whatever no. around a particular injury because it's like, yeah, let's hear their story. Like Eric Clapton coming out when he did and saying, you know, I had a lot of issues with that. That's mm. fine. That's great. Because that's his story that's saying, look, I'm one. Is there anybody else out there? Right. Just to see. Yeah. But the problem is, is it starts getting used to, to look, this is happening all over. Yeah. Like this is just this is everybody, right? Yeah. Um, and the, and my challenge is, is it's like when you dive a little deeper into Celine's syndrome, there are several other people that are that I found in a, a couple of uh, funny enough mainstream media articles where these people were interviewed for the doc for the um, for the article, and they had a uh, oh my god, I just forgot the name the stiff stiff person syndrome SPS. I don't know. Was it stiff it person? Um, I think it was SPS. I think they call it, but, um, some neurological. Yes. Uh, yeah. So those people were diagnosed, uh, in 2020 mm -hmm. after COVID infection. So they, they got COVID infection. They, they had this, right. It's apparently really, really hard to diagnose. Um, but so they, they got it diagnosed when that person then went and got vaccinated, their SPS got worse. Right. So again, now we're starting to see, but it might not even even been COVID. It could have been something else. Couldn't it, might have not yeah, been the vaccine it, for, or COVID. It could have. You're right. It could have. The point is, is um, you're not going to be able to prove the absolute causality yeah, very easily. 
but you're going to be able to show that there's a very close temporal relationship so time between when she got her COVID infection and then you know and you can do that with the vaccine for a lot of people and you can do that and, and, what, and what, bo- what bothers cases. me what's not included in data are like for example there's this page on instagram jab injuries australia yeah thousands of people sharing their vaccine injuries yeah. neurological issues and yeah. there are a lot of very similar things like no one's including that in any data anywhere which ones like the 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 self-reporting on some of these they're not even they're just they're just social media pages like jab injuries australians where yeah. australians are getting their vaccine injury reports out because a lot of people who try and report them are not accepted into the vaccine mm, reporting systems yeah. and i saw an interview with um eric t Payne, a pediatric neurologist from alberta yeah um from the university of Ar- alberta and alberta's children's does he, hospital does he bring the pain <laughs> 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 and he was saying that in hospitals in Alberta where he works at, they're not even, they're phasing vaccine injury reports out. They're not even accepting them anymore. Because there's too many? Uh, no, just because they don't believe that the vaccine, the vaccine can even injury. do something like that. Wow. So, that's and that's wild. where you get, like, we've written about vaccines, like, years before COVID. And, like, we know that there's probably a severe amount of underreporting. And it's because of things like this. And it's because mm-hmm. of things just not being accepted into reporting systems. Like, they're not agreed that it's a vaccine injury. Yeah. So you have a lot of quote unquote data out there. That's not really data that um, publications, doctors, scientists, and people who write about vaccine injuries aren't including. Yeah. So that's why I think vaccine injuries are way greater than any number can ever show. And I think that's why a lot of people out there also feel like this is huge because they see all these things too. Yes. But again, but you, you got to factor can, these things into the equation. You can take those facts and you can decontextualize them. That's my point. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so what you can do is you can you can say okay we have under reporting mm-hmm. and then use that fact of there's under reporting to decontextualize how severe that is yeah you can right? kind of guesstimate and estimate right so what i'm it. saying is what what this requires but not many people are at doing least, that well tons of people are they just don't get the limelight that steve kirsch or some of these other people do mm-hmm. right so there's there's lots of people actually dr jessica rose is very good mm-hmm. um matthew crawford is very good these are people that are like taking the time to go through the data and they're making a very, very strong case that this is, yes, one of the largest medical scandals that will ever exist. Yeah. However, it's, it's very credible and gives you a very clear idea of to what degree this is actually happening, right? Like how many people do you personally know? And this is hard because who are seriously well, injured from the vaccine? No, who are, who died from the vaccine? Um, well, I think I know a few, but their deaths weren't like, um, I have a friend whose father recently died. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was a heart attack. Could have been the vaccine. I don't know. It could have been. It's not, it's not given the mechanism of action and the science shows what can happen. It's not unreasonable to think it's the vaccine. Sure. So, but, it, but, but as far as getting say, the vaccine and then dying like two days later, I don't know anybody. Yeah. And, and, and so I don't know anybody who, who died. Oh, However, actually I know my a friend of my mother's actually who had Parkinson's. Yeah. His Parkinson's just all of a sudden just, after he got vaccinated just accelerated big time. Totally and he makes just sense. Died. Totally yeah, makes sense. So there's stories like a lot of stories and I've never experienced that without, with vaccines before. So yeah. they're, they're definitely, and like people, you know, you know, someone who knows someone who's this, that. Yes. And, so, so, so what I'm saying is that the challenge is, is if I were to ask another friend of mine that, that question, mm-hmm. if I say, how many people do you know were seriously injured by the vaccine, right? Say none. I, I know, I know personally, like personally know them. Um, I think I know of one or two. Mm-hmm. Um, when I start extending out into my circle, mm-hmm. I, th- I hear more stories. And, yeah. and I'm, these are stories and, where it, it's no question. They yeah. got vaccinated the next day. There were problems. And you didn't, didn't see that before COVID. Like you see injuries, but not well, someone you knew like this not, often. Not as common. Yeah. Not as common. Now, here's the kicker is like I know people who have had uh, very large issues. I mean, including myself, I still can't smell properly from COVID mm-hmm. not being vaccinated. Right. So, so I, I personally don't know people who've had issues with COVID other than you, me personally. And you yourself. Well, or are you a hundred percent? I think I'm a hundred percent. No, you're yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. You think so? yeah, okay. I lost my smell for quite a while, but I, you got I, it back? I, I, it's back. 100% okay. So I'd you're say. back. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm like 98. Mm-hmm. Um, but my point is this going back to it before I lose the script here is I can ask another friend of mine, who they're 
their whole family mm -hmm. that is sort of immediate to them, like a mother, a sister, and I believe an aunt. Mm -hmm. And it's not a big family. It's a very small family. Um, they all got seriously vaccine injured. And she's the only one that didn't get vaccinated. Right. So one of them hospital for six months after, mm -hmm. right after vaccination, myocarditis will be on pills for the rest of her life. Mm -hmm. um, another one uh, was, I believe, and I don't want to say the wrong uh, condition, but it's neurological. I don't think it was Bell's palsy, but it might've been Bell's palsy. Mm -hmm. might've been Bell's palsy. And so she has Bell's palsy, Bell's palsy. There's from been no, COVID infection. No, from, oh, vaccine, from the vaccine, from the vaccine. Yeah. And then I'll have somebody else or in her family. Then there's, there's, I believe it was the aunt who got, um, who was vaccinated and then had a, something related. I don't know if it was stroke or heart attack or something related. I heard way too many of these stories. Mm -hmm. I just, I take note of how common it is, but then I'll ask other people mm -hmm. and they know nobody who's even suspected that there's been any issues. Right. Yeah. So going back to the, the, the example of, they Steve think it's Kirsch, ridiculous. Well, going back to the example of Steve Kirsch and what I was trying to say was that if you take a, if I took a sample of my friend over there mm -hmm. and like, she would be like, yeah, everybody I know got injured. You know, that's, that's kind of the feeling, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas I can ask other people and they know no single person. Yeah. And then you, there are a lot of people who know else, a lot of people who have compl complications from COVID infection. Lots of people. So, yeah. so my point or is who died from like, COVID. Yeah, yeah. this is the importance of looking Supposedly. at a wide scale yeah. when they do studies, yeah. right? The whole purpose of a study is to generate enough people in the study yeah. so that they can apply it to real world results. It's why they, when you have a study of a thousand people, it doesn't do anything. Right. It doesn't say anything, yeah, it's right? Like, be big. The yeah. fact that Pfizer approved the vaccines for kids based on, I think it was like 1200 kids or something. That's I, insane. Yeah. I think from 12 to 15, right? it was like even 800 and one of them was severely injured, which is crazy. Yes, and you have you have even the main Pfizer trial, yeah. which was only I believe it was about twenty two to twenty four thousand people in each arm, which mm -hmm. means based on twenty two twenty four thousand people, which means any injury that is that is uh, like one in twenty five thousand is not going to show up in that study very mm -hmm. reliably. Yeah. And, and any injury that's one in fifty thousand, and they haven't is even released all their data, so we still don't know. That's right. We don't know really so, anything. So, so the point is, is it's like you you have to you have like you have to to adjust for these large data sets, these yeah. large portions of people. Right. And, and I've, and I've done these breakdowns, uh, you know, on the pulse YouTube, trying to, to talk about this. Yeah. And even with all the numbers, even with everything there, you're still talking about something that is injuring people anywhere between like, for about serious injury, maybe around 7% at the most. Right. I would say given, given the underreporting, I believe happens yeah. with vaccine injuries, I would say it's at least 7% personally. And, it, and that's what I'm saying. It's a reasonable, it's Even a very reasonable number. 7% is ridiculously, ridiculously huge. That's very high. People very, don't realize that. Like, and that's what I'm saying. It's like, it doesn't have to be that when I, when you ask questions to people, oh yeah, 50% of people are seriously injured and will die within the next three or four years. Mm -hmm. It's like, you realize that has never, that's, that would be so unprecedented and never happened. Like you yeah. would be seeing people all die over everywhere. the place. Yeah. Every, it would be, it would be obvious. Street, you wouldn't be able to walk down the yeah. street without seeing. And that's, that's why I had doubts about that. If there's an actual pandemic going on, cause like if there was a real pandemic, you'd probably go outside go in, in public and see people well, sick all over the place. That depends I don't, on the definition of pandemic. Uh, yeah. But, I, yeah. I don't think it was a pandemic. I think, I didn't think we saw anything much different than what we've seen from other flu seasons, this and that other than the fact that, yeah, we saw maybe a little more extreme in the elderly population cause it was a new virus. Yeah. But to declare a pandemic and to lock down and to all that stuff, I think, I don't think we were experiencing something that extraordinary that called for any of that. Yeah, I, I but would. But this is another conversation. I mean, you can go down and we can. We fight always about, fight about this yeah. one because I agree. Like, I don't, I, I do not believe in the measures. I, I don't think we needed to mask. We didn't need to lock down. Um, we didn't need to rush to vaccination. I believe we had treatment. I think the biggest, the two biggest, um, non-vaccination travesties are one the lack of conversation around treatment oh, yeah. especially early on they let people die like if imagine there was a flu pandemic they'd be treating people with antivirals they'd be trying anything. like they already do yes and all of a sudden oh covid 19 you can't Wait, use antivirals works. zero no, no. things work. and you can't have like you pointed out you can't have emergency authorization without yep if something else works you can't emergency authorize exactly. a vaccine so, so i think works. there was zero conversation around like now oh, yeah. 
in the mainstream, they'll talk about exercise. Yeah. They'll talk about, you know, vitamin C. Nutrition vitamin, and, back yeah. in the day, remember we were being oh, we were fact-checked. Fact-checked for talking we about censored. vitamin C. Even though there so, were clinical trials with vitamin C in China and hospitals were um, right. encouraging all their staff to take vitamin C and they're doing intravenous vitamin C right. for severe COVID patients and a lot of them recovered. So all of the things that they're now talking about now mm -hmm. in the mainstream, we talked about in 2020 and were, we're censored for punished right? for it yeah. so so this is what i'm saying that is a travesty which is why you need to sign up for the yeah. <laughs> yes go support us on the explorer yeah, lounge we so. need your support or yeah sorry Anyways, that's it that's all <laughs> yeah. um Just plug it in there for plug it in. an hour plug and 10 minutes in, into the conversation in. where no one's going to listen to until for all those uh, who are still with us we love you <laughs> <laughs> but no but again going back to it is it's like um that is one of the biggest travesties to me the yeah, other yeah. one for me is um, the fact the lab leak discussion. Uh, that is that is huge because for me, lab leak is probably the most probable, or it seems high, oh, the most probable yes. explanation. That's so much evidence when you look at what it means, right? Mm -hmm. So. It, well, again, they're not design, denying it in the mainstream anymore. They're like, yeah, could the, the, well, the argument is, okay, it was unintentional. Sure. Yeah. Unintentional, right? Yeah. You know, so, so yeah, it's an argument of whether it was intentional or unintentional or not. I believe it was intentional. The point is, is why are they studying? So, so again, you look at it. They're studying a virus that is, um, that they're trying to enhance its ability to not only latch to people, but produce problems. I know. Right. So, so my problem is this. Okay. So they literally engineered a bioweapon. Mm -hmm. The bioweapon was supposed to be more harmful than it would be if it was just totally natural. Why would they do that? Let's pause for a second before we get there. So when you start having conversations around like, oh man, look at how good the spike protein was at latching onto people and causing these little issues and right. causing all these problems. You're like, oh, okay. So it's a travesty to not recognize that a virus was specifically designed and then whether released intentionally or unintentionally killed millions of people. Viruses aren't real. Just joking. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, no, that's, that, a that's a whole other conversation. Day, but, yeah. but, but, you know, killed millions of people. Yeah. And then on top of that, they take the thing. Just that, like other viruses might add. Well, they, we can, again, we can argue that, but it's like mm -hmm. they take the thing that seems to be causing the most issue, which is a spike protein. Mm -hmm. They use that spike protein for the, the, in terms of the vaccine's methodology mm -hmm. of producing immunity. Right. So, so a, now you a have. A synthetic form of the spike protein. But yes. Well, yes, but the point is, is mm -hmm. you have a. And it's much different. It's actually not that different. It is. It's slightly different. It's, it's much different. That. My last, that article I wrote, I put differences in there. It's. Yes, there are differences. Right. There are, so there are people who will argue that the differences actually make the spike protein from the vaccine safer. And you're arguing that it makes it more dangerous. And yes. then other people are arguing that it's not the spike protein, it's the nanolipid particle. Well, the right? spike protein is, it gets, the, the nanolipid particle transports the spike protein. Yes. Yes. So what I'm saying, but they're, what they're trying to say is that the nanolipid particle itself is the problematic piece to the puzzle, right? So there's my, my general point is, is if we should you, have a podcast on synthetic verse, I'm, there's, I'm, I'm there's so many people that I'm convinced that for this. it's, yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's a, a lot different. It's a there's, hard conversation. There's no denying that it's a lot different. That's for sure. Well, again, we're going back to what does a lot mean? Because the whole design of the spike protein is that your nerve, your immune system has to be able to recognize that it is the same. So it has to be fairly similar. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'd have to pull up my article right now. There's a, a pro, immunologist from the University of Guelph, not Brian, but another one who Brian. outlined, and I put it in my last article, who outlined various differences of why the spike protein, uh, the synthetic spike protein is very different. And um, again, I, I don't think people And it does disagree. things that the natural spike protein doesn't do yes so i don't think people disagree that there are going to be differences in the synthetic versus the natural I mean, and at that cellular is, small level like differences like that are huge ab absolutely yeah uh, absolutely but my, my general point is is it's like they took the same destructive element of yeah. the virus and used it in a vaccine yeah which they do for other vaccines i mean that's how you, yes yeah, but yeah. they what i'm saying is they knew that this thing was producing so many unintended consequences early yeah. on. Again, go back to that piece I did with Madhava where he chronicles 
all of the doctors in the hospitals that were receiving huge influxes, because you know how there's some hospitals that had like no COVID and the other hospitals where they were like, holy crap. The, the point is, is they there was all these records of way before vaccine, people coming in. Uh, uh, this is this is the pathology. This is what's happening. This person had myocarditis. This person ended up with a stroke. This person ended right, up right, with right. a heart attack. This person ended up with... So they have, they have this whole discussion around how they can't understand why this virus is... At the time, right? Mm. This seemed to be producing more unintended consequences than than uh, than a normal virus. Now, don't forget when mm. when I say this, you Maybe. assume COVID as a whole. I'm specifically talking about alpha strain. Alpha right, right. strain was vicious. Yeah, the first right? ones are always the most very, vicious. Very and that, vicious. I agree with that because it was a new virus. Absolutely. But now, like. Exactly. If Alpha Strain came back, we wouldn't right. even see the same so, so kind my, of thing. So my point because... is, is were those doctors wrong at the time in saying that, you know, the the virus Alpha Strain was producing like, whoa, like really intense consequences? No, yeah. I don't think they were wrong. Yeah, I don't think they were I wrong. I think they'd be wrong to say that about the totality of the COVID-19 virus and mm -hmm. all its mutations. Yes, I would yeah. say that it's wrong. I would but say it was initial... initially it was intense, but I still wouldn't, I would say it was more than a very severe flu season, but not a but significant. But again, it depends on what you're talking about, right? Because the alpha strain was not incredibly contagious. It was just very intense for those who got it, right? For older people. Yeah. Uh, yes, older people, you're right. I don't uh, think it affected kids very much at all. Especially with comorbidities. Yeah. Of course. Like all people over 50, yes. All these things are true. What I'm, what I'm getting at is... Um, it was a different virus in all of its stages, right? Yeah, for sure. And, like and, all other viruses. Right. Yeah. And my general point is is just that we took that vicious spike protein from alpha, mm -hmm. used it as the vaccine yeah. for every other mutated and, version. But we And before that it was put out there from a lab. Right. Which is crazy. So my point is is we're utilizing the most vicious version mm -hmm. of COVID to vaccinate people. Mm -hmm. Why? <laughs> like yeah. it doesn't even like and then we, it, we it's not even effective for other strains if right it's only the alpha so people are producing they're producing alpha antibodies so that's why they're not able to fight another strain if they've been vaccinated it's a lot of complications right. and stuff and so what all i'm getting natural at immunity is, is thrown out the window the, this conversation is a complex one right yeah, very complex. there are ways to argue things from all angles the, mm -hmm. the general point is is that like there's some really great evidence, some really great follies here that suggest that profitability, uh, you know, um, wanting to to have more control, more authoritarian yeah, and that, roll out more measures, justify right. like and, uh, and there's a, there's a really great example. argument there for that, that I think when you present the evidence to people, they can't turn around and go, oh, well, you know, this is just complete bullshit. But when you start presenting all of the more extreme, crazier evidence, I see people just shut right down. Oh yeah, right. And yeah. that's and that this is again my that's point. That's the main point. Yeah. This is my my point is it's just like I I just I I don't know I just don't nope. see how we move forward. We well we move forward by doing what you said needs to be done, which I feel like people are doing. It's just they're not being extreme and they're not getting like, attention. Now, now it so, feels like people just want revenge. So we're in the process. A good chunk of people, it feels like. I shouldn't say everybody, but it feels like there's a there's a large amount of people that at this point want revenge. And I understand why. Mm -hmm. I understand why because they were lied to. They were misled. People they, lost their jobs. They lost their people jobs. People lost their they businesses. Yeah, they lost People lost everything. their livelihoods. Yes. Except for those who are vaccinated. And those who are vaccinated don't really understand the impact yeah. these mandates had and how lives were destroyed so sure. easily yeah so obviously if i was one of those people and yeah it's, and I, I was angry when they locked down i lost sure. my freedom i wasn't able to do things i wanted to do and it yeah, was, i still can't go to the u.s again this is yeah this we is still can't one. go to the u.s people and, don't understand and that. if stuff like this can happen <laughs> so easily just imagine what can happen in the future yes what can they you know yeah. this is but at the same time i was encouraged to see how many people even yeah. vaccinated people started Starting seeing through this but mind. at the start they were yeah. all for it get in your house what are you doing yeah, yeah. You doing? Oh, it, it takes time call like my people, neighbors. eventually yeah. people are going to see through bullshit measures i have faith always but yeah. yeah my general point after all this is that there is a a, a large importance to good sense making yes. and showing up to a conversation in good faith
meaning don't try and just utilize facts to prove don't your try and be point right. and taking those facts out of context to try yeah. like exactly go with the spirit of trying to understand the totality of something try and understand the truth about something instead of trying to be right about something yeah don't and get caught don't get captured by narratives yeah and use whatever That's, you can to prove your point and get carried away i talked i've talked to so many people like that like yeah. they just go hard with whatever they can and you're thinking like arjun you're one of those people <laughs> just, <you're, laughs> just, i mean there's probably times where i'm uh, like uh, i don't think you've thought this through yeah, but yeah. we when all we fight, do that about fight. stuff like yeah. i you know i this maybe we can even cap it off with this is we haven't talked about aliens yet no, let's Should talk we? about aliens on a, I want to do a podcast because okay. yeah. there's a lot of issues out there with aliens. And I want to talk about how I come across so many people lately that think they're demonic and this and that. Yeah, and, yeah. and I just want to, you know, they could, you know, that we'll save it for the next discussion. Yeah, but yeah. Cause that's a long conversation. Yeah. But, um, the, the, the one of the, one of the things where we could, we could go with this. It's like, what have you changed your mind on mm-hmm. since you started writing about COVID? to now i know this what are the things you've changed your mind on maybe that i used to think that covid was nothing at all to be really concerned about which i still kind of do but i do see i wasn't really covid made me aware of just how dangerous i know a lot of people don't believe in viruses but viruses are Mm -hmm. like not just covid like rsv and the flu especially for older people with comorbidities um i kind of changed my mind with i thought that everyone I knew who was vaccinated, like my, I have someone in my family, for example, right now, I'm surprised he's still alive. So it's like, yeah. and he's been vaccinated four times. Um, and just someone who was forced to get vaccinated, he didn't want to get vaccinated. Mm-hmm. And so. Why are you surprised he's still alive? I don't know. I just guess I thought, given what I've looked at with the science and all the injuries and the mechanisms of action that can lead to injuries, I just, I got caught up in thinking that like we might talked about earlier that the majority of people who took this vaccine will eventually die from it and maybe it's mm-hmm. true maybe mm-hmm. next year it'll be from the vaccine but um what have i changed my mind about covid nothing i was right yeah. to the <laughs> exactly no, no, no. no honestly though i no, haven't so far you said yeah recognizing some maybe that it. covid is a bit more the main thing is covid is a bit more of a concern mm-hmm. than what i once thought it was because yeah. i got covid i lost my sense of smell and I hadn't been like, I was only sick, for, really sick for a couple of days, but I hadn't been that sick for years. Yeah. Except when I was like a kid and taking flu shots and throwing up all the time from the flu. And then I stopped. <laughs> and you remember those days? I don't know. Like I, and yeah. then like all of a sudden I, I hadn't like hadn't experienced that for so long, but I hadn't experienced this type of sickness for so long. And like, it was manageable. It was fine. Like yeah. I just Didn't need bad to headaches. Hospital, yeah. Yeah. It's like a very severe flu. I would call it, which I've never mm-hmm. experienced since I was like a tiny kid. But I did lose my sense of smell for many months, as you did, and yours is still not 100%. And so, like, still not a big deal, and, like, I'm glad I reaped the benefits of natural immunity. And so maybe that changed, where I thought COVID was not really a big deal. And I still, to be honest, I still don't really think it's that big of a deal if you look at chances of hospitalization and death from yep. COVID and severe complications sure. in our yeah. age group. Again, but, that's that's all the context, yeah, right? Yeah, the con- yeah. When you put the things in the context, you start to see what the actual risk is. And you yeah. go, yeah, sure, there's some risk, but it's not when you don't have the context. Yeah. What about you? Uh, for me... What did you... Uh, when, when, it first, when it first got word of it, mm-hmm. back in uh, March of 20... Or maybe it was yeah. February... February? Maybe it was it was because there was there was there was, was early March, yeah, late February. People were talking in January about um yeah. you know what was going on in China and stuff and we were we were kind of tracking it. They, and, it know. hit hard in first week of March. Yeah. That's when they locked down. That's actually. when they locked down. So this would have been back definitely in February then. Yeah. Um I I remember getting a uh, a message from Stephen Greer actually. Hmm. Oh, um man. and he was saying, Oh, you know, it spoke to some of my contacts in intelligence community and this virus that everybody's talking about uh originated in a lab it was part of a laboratory experiment and um there are more lethal versions of it that still exist in the lab but the one that whether got out or released i don't think he mentioned maybe they're saving um, the lethal is is meant to be highly infectious at some point but not necessarily kill a lot of people and i thought that's a pretty interesting you know that essentially turned out to be true i mean anybody could have 
potentially guess that because um, yeah, yeah. viruses, this is what they do, right? And the scary thing is to think if they do have more dangerous stuff in a lab. Yeah. Like what could they do next? Well, that's what, that's the, that's the G14, that's the next G14 pandemic. layer of classification. <laughs> No one's but, gonna get that joke. No, they won't get that joke. That's yeah. fine. Um, but it's for just you and me. That joke. Um, no, but the uh, so when when I heard that, in combination with we didn't know much, mm-hmm. um, I thought, okay, yeah, this could be a big deal. Um, and I remember, you know, looking up the vitamin C stuff and and uh, vitamin D and zinc, and I remember looking up all this stuff and trying to share with people like, hey guys, like you know, prepare yourself just so just in case, because we don't know how bad this thing is yet, whatever. So I kind of thought it was going to be pretty bad. Then once the numbers started to come out, uh, IFR, hospitalization rates, whatever. Um, I remember John Ioannidis' piece and, and I was like, oh, maybe this isn't that big of a deal. And then I felt, yeah, this isn't that big of a deal. And then I kept looking and, and I'm like, ah, but there are certain things like for some people, maybe this is a really big yeah. deal. And this you is know, where you and I disagreed a lot. This you is where we started it was, to this disagree. was a very big deal. something completely different. I thought this is nothing different that humanity has <clears throat> never experienced before. Yeah. I, I basically went from, I know I did. I wouldn't say there's something humanity never experienced. I, I believed that, that there were, you know, plagues and pandemics in the right. past. That were well, I, I mean, like from the point of this is something that humanity hasn't experienced before within the past like 10 years. It's just like a severe flu season. Yeah, I would say, yeah. Which I kind of changed my thoughts now, but I'm still kind of on that wave. I still but, think this is one of the the, the more worst situations we've had in, right. in memory. See, I um, disagree because like deaths, overcounting don't of deaths and all that. Don't even think about deaths. Don't even think about deaths. Like, like we... we, we Keep this podcast going for another yeah, hour. Yeah, but but again, that. there's a lot of ways to think about it. You, you don't have to think solely about deaths. You can think about unintended consequences. You could think about, you know, uh, the amount of people that get, that get sick. You could think about how it impacts hospital systems in some areas. Right. It doesn't have to be every area, right? It's it's some areas, right? right. Um, it is, I think it was still a hard thing to deal with, right? Like I think it was a hard thing to deal with, but not too much different from what we've been experiencing in the last few decades. Yeah, I would but, agree. Uh, but again, what is, but what then is too I, much, I right? could be wrong to, it's a, that's a completely separate conversation. Again, I, I go back to, I go back to the, the, because, thing, the things that have resonated with me the most mm-hmm. off the hop were the great Barrington de- declaration. Yeah. Right. And it, it acknowledges that we had to do something about this because it was problematic enough yeah. that something had to be done. Yeah. The question was, what do you do? And and we, I we think, should have fucking treated people. Yes, there should have been treatments. There <laughs> should have been treatment. focused protection, right? Yeah. As opposed to, we made problems way worse yeah. by doing what we did. Yeah. And even when we learned, you could argue, oh, you know, lockdowns were necessary the first time. Mm-hmm. Okay, fine. Lockdown for thirty days. You realize, hey guys, this wasn't that big a deal. We're sorry. Let's just get everything going back again. Here's how we're going to focus protect. But they never veered from that. And they kept they, they kept locking down. And they kept and they still want to use lockdowns in future pandemics. Right. So yeah. so the point is, is it's like, uh, yes, it was there was so much irresponsibility. But I, I generally agree with what the Great Barrington because again, uh, t- to me, I see enough that like something had to be done. The question is, is what exactly is what we disagree? For me, what needed to be done was what we've been doing already years prior to COVID. Just treat people, which that was the biggest change, I think, that we saw that made things worse. Yeah. People weren't being treated with yes. antivirals Treating, like they would be treated for other viruses. I also probably, especially early on, would have told older people and specifically with comorbidities to be more careful about who you're around. Yeah, 100%. Even before COVID, like... If you had an elder person, you had the flu. You don't go around them. They don't go around you. Like this was common practice. Right. That's focused protection. Yes. Like, and 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 the, so, but this, the, the, I think the idea is this should have been the health advice. And, oh, one hundred percent. And this should have been how things are focused. On. Ideally, However, like health advice should have been folk. Don't go around people who are sick. Like, uh, focus protection. Antiviral medication should be available. Vitamin C, D, zinc. All these recommendations that are, like, a lot of doctor yeah. groups are making now. Like that would have been ideal. Instead, we just locked down put people on ventilators has probably killed more people. And then uh, yeah. say there was no treatment and we have to wait for a fucking vaccine. vaccine yeah. Like, it was ridiculous. so, so again, what did I change my mind on? Um, going from, I thought it was going to be an issue, learned more, thought it was like literally just the flu. Mm-hmm. Then I realized, yeah, it's probably just a little bit worse than the flu, especially early right. on. 
right? Yeah. What does, is Omicron worse than the flu? No, I think Omicron is less than the flu, right? But my point is, is we're talking about at, at the different stages of the pandemic and seeing what it was doing. And um, I, I just changed my mind bit, bits about severity. Right. Um, and uh, and I think I just, I think I got clearer as time went on about sort of like and i don't think i was ever in the camp like i didn't want to be vaccinated it, to me it didn't make sense i don't think i was ever in the camp that like it was going to be like lethal to like tons and tons and tons of the people vaccine? yeah right, right i don't think i ever went quite that far i probably i don't know if i i don't know if i've changed my mind about it depends what things. you define yeah. as tons of people like to me like i said earlier what's happened is historical and record-breaking with vaccine injuries sure um but again historical and record-breaking with vaccine injuries it goes back to like you were saying earlier you know your your family member has four shots and you're surprised they're alive i'm, right. I'm not right because my my feeling is that I, I at least not anywhere like nobody can predict at what point everyone just starts dropping dead right anybody who's saying that is just saying that based on their their own i want to say this right mm -hmm. my point is is up to this point, have ten percent of people who have been vaccinated died? Not even close. Have um, I don't know. I, again, you see, but, but we don't know. Do the math. You can't say not even close. Just like you can say you can't say yes. You can't say no. The infection fatality. It's rate, a possibility. The infection fatality rate of COVID was what? I don't know. Like very low. What is it? I don't know. It's like under a percent. I would say, yeah, it's way under a percent. Yeah. So you're trying to say that... Like survival rate in infection fatality. Right. For so certain we, age we, groups, let's say 99.98. It was, it was hard to see where people were dying, but we all kind of know somebody who died from COVID. Yes, or, but you know, the mainstream but, disagrees with the infection fatality rates of like ionitis and all these people. But. Yeah, that's fine. But even if they suggest, I think the mainstream sometimes suggests it's about 1%. They're happy yeah. with the number 1%. New York Times recently tried to say 3% and everyone ripped them for it. But I know where you're going with this. You're like, how many people is that? Well, yeah, but that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. This is how you can actually land on this number is mm -hmm. you can start to do the math and start looking at what those numbers look like. Right. And you start realizing that for you to say that it's more than 10%. Then right, I'm saying that it would be like, how many millions of people is that then? If I'm saying my point is this. If you're not seeing everybody at 1% infection fatality rate of COVID, if you're not seeing people all over the place drop dead from COVID, and, and yet you're saying that 10 times more people are dying from the vaccine, but you're not seeing people do drop dead all over the place in your life from the vaccine, then it's likely that they're probably about the same or maybe the vaccine's less or well, who knows? It's tough because right? people like, die all the time in a large numbers. Like how many people die a day? Like it's probably crazy, right? Yeah. So we just don't know. Like... We don't know how many people have died from the vaccine. Like according to injury, injury surveillance systems, like I would say over a million people have died from the vaccine. But but again, you at can, least I, I'm not yeah, which is a very that's, small number. That's What's, fine. How many percent is that? Like two or something? I don't even know. A million people. Yeah, died from the vaccine. That would Let's be nowhere say. near two percent. Exactly. So it's that's yeah. a low number. Yeah, my point is is if some for if somebody were to suggest that like ten percent of people vaccinated died. You, again, I'd have to look at the math again, but that would be a, a massive, massive amount of people. It would. You'd have to look at, let's say, f let's say how many people are on the planet? Eight billion. Let's say five billion people received at least one dose, right? I don't even know if it's that high, but it's. But, yeah. I don't know. Let's just say, for argument's sake, I think it's pretty high. Um, we could look it up. Yeah. Let's yeah. Look it continue. Up. Continue. But anyways, let's just say four billion people received at least one dose. Yeah. How many of those 4 billion people have died since the rollout of the vaccines? Probably a shitload. Yeah, from, from the vaccine. From whatever. No, yeah, not you, from the vaccine. Just uh, died in general. Oh, you know I what mean, I'm saying? yeah. Car I mean, accidents. It, 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 yeah, you'd have to. But th this is, so again, like, it's like, I think there's a lot. My point is this. There is a lot more data that is collected every year that we have that we can, that's out there that I've looked at, that like I said, guys like Matthew Crawford are looking at and other people that answers a lot of these questions where we where we don't have to say, oh, we have no idea. Because um, we, we have a pretty good idea. We know it's lots. But again, 
the word lots or a lot doesn't mean record anything number. unless it's in context. A record number amount of vaccine. No, nope. and I'm I don't disagree with record number. Like record number though is like saying uh, I, I don't think I made, anyone. I made two baskets uh, unless out you're of twenty. Unless shots, you're factoring, then I made three <laughs> baskets out of twenty uh, shots. Record number. Unless <laughs> no 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 no, it's way more than that. No no, Come what I'm trying to say is by saying record number, you're not saying anything other than okay that it's a record number. Say. 80 times percent more people vaccine injury reports compared to other vaccines 80 times yeah like like so here's a graph yeah and this is COVID. right but but again those are graphs right right what i'm what i'm getting at is so okay numbers. let's say measles so it, death reported to vaccine injury reported si reporting systems for measles hold on from let me, let me just from pause five years hold on hold on yeah, yeah five deaths COVID. yes two million Okay. Something like that. Yeah. So, so raw numbers. So this is my point. That's crazy. And, and then my point under reporting, you're probably, I would say, I personally would say no one can really put a number on this, but 90% of vaccine injuries go unreported. So then you skyrocket that number even more. Right. So, so on the under reporting, what I have thought, because I've thought about this a lot, the more, the more discussion there is about vaccine hesitancy since way back in the day up until now, even before COVID, the more reports there's going to be because the more people are aware of theirs. See what I've right? looked into. Then you have, I don't know, the most controversial moment about vaccines in human history is COVID in human history. Mm -hmm. The awareness around VAERS drove up dramatically. So you're going to, yeah. you're, you're not going to have the same level of underreporting, but you're still going to have lots of underreporting. Uh, I'm not taking that away. Yeah, Maybe not the but, same amount, but you're still going to have a shitload. Yes. So yeah. the question is again, the answers of like how much and what is it so so my point is is it's like what the vaccine cautionary sphere sometimes does not make a good enough attempt to do is provide an absolute versus relative risk when it comes to vaccine injury and death right this is the exact same way the mainstream manipulated but, everybody but you they gave them a relative risk of right, right, right. how the yeah. vaccine was going to save her but they gave no but absolute you're still, risk you still kind of do the same thing when you say People say 10 million people died from the vaccine. When you say there's no way, you're doing the same thing as no, the no, people I, say who I, say. But that. I'm making points, right? The points I'm, the points I, there so are that, points, you can make points to, to show that a shitload of people have died. Yes, and you can I'm, make not, I'm not, but again, I, I, we have to get back to brass tacks. Fight! No, we, we'd We're have fighting. to get back to brass tacks. No one's going to follow this podcast all the way up no, to the I fight. Mean, uh, to me, it's, it's a good, it's a good thing. How many people died? Um, I don't even remember what I was supposed to be looking at. But the point is... Oh, you're supposed to be looking at how many people have been vaxxed, had had oh, at least one people? dose in the, on the world. Maybe if you like type in how many people have had... I think like at least 4 billion have had one dose. No? Um, Might be hard to find. It shouldn't be. Hmm. Um, yeah, so 5.4 billion now. Yeah, so if you, my thing, what I was saying, so yeah. say take all those 5.4 billion, mm -hmm. and then how many of those 5.4 billion have died since they've had the vaccine? Like be it car crash, be it heart attack, be it accident, be it whatever, right? Mm -hmm. I wonder what that number is. Um, Yes, because like we know a, sh a crap load. It's going to be huge because we know yeah. how many people die every day. Like yes. world population is actually going to start going down in like fifteen years because deaths from various causes are just skyrocketing. Yes. Um, um, so like if it's ridiculous to say all those people die because of the vaccine, obviously that's not what I'm saying. But I'm just saying um, like of course could there um, be a, what percentage of those could the vaccine have played in a factor whether it be stroke heart attack parkinson's alzheimer's this and that whatever like it, we don't know the answers to these questions and we will never know yes but uh, what but the, the that's like, why you have to go back to the science and the mechanism what of actions I'm, what i'm what trying yeah of course of course all these things what i'm guess. trying to get you at, can't get a number yes but you're guessing there's an intelligent guess there's a, a an unintelligent so like guess, if you say 10 million guess. out of 5.4 billion that's not unreasonable Okay, um, let me just do a quick, a quick.
Oh, that's the wrong. I did that wrong. I wonder what 10 million out of 5.4 billion is in percent. So if, for example, you had almost 1%. 1%. So almost of 1%. Percent of so people? I'm, what I'm what I'm doing is I'm saying, let's say you had, let's just do it at 1%. 1%? It's the what are you saying? Thing. 1% of people 1 who percent die from the vaccine? 1% of people who get vaccine will die. Are dying from the vaccine. So Even if it's just one dose. 1% of 5.4 so billion. So 1% is 5.4 million people. Out of 5.4 billion. Billion, right. Right. So what, I, what I'm trying to say is. So, so 10, 10 million 10, 10 would million be 2%. Would be two percent. So when s- when someone says ten percent of people died, that is, w- I see what you're saying. Right. So yeah. what I'm what I'm trying to get at is, w- I don't think mm-hmm. that the that up to this point will say it's mm-hmm. the easiest way to say it. Meaning there could be people that die five years down the road, and and someone's going to argue that was because of the vaccine. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I I don't know, right? right, right, right? right, right. But up to this point, I don't think one percent of people that have been vaccinated have died. I don't think so. But I don't know. I think it's a possibility. It could be. Yeah. I, I don't know, right? But what I'm saying is it could be 3%. I wouldn't know the difference. Could be 10. It could be 10%. I highly doubt it, but yeah. I, I wouldn't know the difference. Yeah. That's, we that's wouldn't what know I'm the getting Because it's global and there's people all around the world and there's billions of people on the planet. And, that's, and that's millions of people are dying. I don't know if, how, many, how many people die a day. Just curious. Let's look that up. Yeah, well, now, we're, now we're just... This, just this one is more. The stat episode. How, how many people die a day around the world? In the world or something. What do you get? Um... Like they just they don't want to answer the question straight. It's like it's always like, here's... We're, okay, there we go. Uh, 183,000. A day? A day. So one, two, so 10 days, eight days, a million people die every eight days. It's all with the vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> but see, so many people yeah. die, right? But and then, then you got to go into right. causes, car accidents, and that. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. I'm saying, what I'm saying but is, anyways, is we're off track. it's a hard thing. Yes. What I'm saying is if people actually took the time and did the math, they mm-hmm. would realize how laughable some of their yes. projections and, are. And you shouldn't make those projections because they make you without evidence and data. And that's why in my articles, because even even a 0.5% is a huge ass huge. number that's concerning and is more than enough <laughs> to show what you right. need to show. So when you make a, a statement yes. like, yes. Yes. And there's, yes. There's a lack of context. It's, it's okay to speculate and share your beliefs like that. But if you're going to use evidence, you have none. Well, it just goes back to what yeah. is your intent? That's like when I say, when you say 10%, I say could have been. I don't have evidence for that. That's just my, that's just my pure belief. But also sometimes mm-hmm. you say that because you're like, you never know. Yeah. Uh, you, you're not, you don't actually, you, you haven't actually thought about it. You yeah. just want to say, you never know though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, hour 45, we should probably cut her down. Yeah. Um, but the um, point is at the end of the day is uh, good sense making matters. Good sense making is important. Very important. It's, uh, good to change your mind. It's good to be open. And it's to not being done by the mainstream and it's not being done on the alternative well, yeah, two extremes but you know yeah. it, 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 well not yeah, saying the, that we're doing a good job is a big landscape and the mainstream is a big landscape the point is is that it exists yeah you know, and it everywhere. seems there's no effort to do the sense making like we actually put in effort we're not right maybe all the time we're not but we at least try our best to make sense of things without latching onto a claim and not providing i would, evidence I would and, agree yeah, and, yeah. and again this is where just just always have the motto it's like i'm going towards the truth wherever the evidence leads like wherever the evidence leads whatever i'm trying to like put a good faith effort into figuring out if it leads here then it leads there and that's okay and if it means that you're wrong about something no big deal mm-hmm. right um and this is, you know, it comes back to, you know, check out the five days of you challenge. I'll put a link in the description. Check out our bias course in, uh, in our membership. These are helpful tools that help us be in ourselves, help us connect more deeply with ourselves, um, explore our own biases, explore our own minds, uh, reignite curiosity. It doesn't allow us to get as caught up in narrative capture and we become a more, uh, I'll say effective part and impactful part of the sense making process, but I think we've yeah. lost Arjumalia to the notepad at this point. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a long episode. <laughs> so that's My all. attention span is gone. That's all. That happens. All right. It's okay. Though. Good talk, though. Anyway, that's, it. that's all. Thanks everybody so much for listening and supporting everything we do here at uh, the Pulse and Collective Evolution. That's it. That's all. We'll catch you next time.